What do you know about it? So far. What do I know about it? I don't no, know. No, whatever you heard. Whatever you heard. I, all I know is that it's, uh, the, it's like your Bible. Right. And um, I don't know much about it. Oh, they don't teach about it. But no. I'm just okay, just tell you. Yeah, uh, just read it. There's another book like this and another yeah. book like that. I think that we actually in, in um, next term, um, right? In, in the, we have different courses every, right. every term, and next right. term we're going to do all the different types of the, the Muslims and all that. Right, the, the, the Jews the, maybe, and about yeah. the Hindus. Yeah, all the different types. They teach of what is called comparative religion. Yeah, about the others. You see, this title that we have given, the Al Quran, Al in Arabic means the definite article, the the the, mm. the Quran. And the last testament, this has come as a surprise, you see, to the Christian especially. But the Christian is used to the Old Testament and the New Testament. They never heard the term the last testament. Did you hear anything like that in your life? No. You see, I had an occasion to use this the first time when I was called to Swaziland. King Sabuza, the old man, you know, the king of Swaziland. Uh, his eldest wife, she died. And uh, there was a controversy in Swaziland as to how long is a man to wait before he can remarry. But since King Subhuz had other eight wives, that controversy turned from how long is a man to wait to how long is a woman to wait. Suppose Subhuz had died, how long are his wives to wait yes. before they can remarry? So the, the topic changed from how long the man is to wait to how long is the woman to wait. And there was a controversy raging in Swaziland. Different churches had different opinions, different views on the subject. And they were arguing and debating. So King Sobhuza called a synod. You know, all the Christians in the country. Yes. And they also have a thousand sects and denominations among the Swazis, like anywhere else, yeah. like in the rest of Africa. They tell us that in South Africa among the whites there are a thousand different churches and denominations, and among the blacks there are three thousand. There are different, different churches, so a little, little thing. Yes. Like in America there are forty different Baptist churches, different. So this Baptist church, no music in the church. That Baptist church, music, but no dancing. The other one, dancing is allowed, and so on and on. Forty different Baptist churches. One won't go to the other. So, among the Swazis, these different churches are been debating, so the king says, let's call up a synod. And there was a Swazi Muslim. So he called me. He said, look, we also have a point of view. So I went down to the synod. We were accommodated in the king's crawl, in the yard, in the grass. And we sat there and the arguments and debates started from 7 o'clock in the morning, sitting in the grass. No tea break, no lunch break, you know, the American is, he is tough, you know, he's going on and on. So about 5 o'clock my turn came. That's what was the afternoon in the afternoon. And by then, you know, so many had their say. And the Swazi, one fellow comes along, master orators, the Africans are master orators. Everyone a potential Billy Graham. You know, among us, Billy Graham is somebody. Yes, yes. Among them, every African is a Billy Graham. <laughs> you know, he's an orator. Uh, I'm not, no reflection. I'm your hero. Every day. <laughs> so, uh, so one fellow comes along, he makes a point. So everybody says, hurrah. You know. And the next guy comes along, and he says, polish. Polish means polish, means all rubbish. What he said is all rubbish. And he makes his point, and everybody says, hurrah. Anyway, next guy comes along, is a polish. It's all rubbish. What is a garbage? You know, junk. Yeah. What this guy said is all junk. You could each one in turn. No, yeah. just, just brush his name off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, he makes his point. The way he does it, everybody says, Burra. <laughs> <laughs> so my turn comes. Uh, so I said, you know what? We are discussing this problem from morning to now. And we haven't come to an answer yet. No, no solution to the problem. Because, I said, you are quoting the Old Testament and you are quoting the New Testament. You are quoting the New Testament and you are quoting the Old Testament. 
and the Old Testament and the New Testament has not got the answer. I said, the answer is in the last testament. You know, I got, so what is this? Never heard of it. I said, look, here, here. I had it in my hand, the Quran. I said, here, this is the last testament. This book has the answer to your problem. And you don't have to think. You don't have to deduce anything. Listen. So, chapter 2, verse 234, I think it was. I started reading to the audience. It says that if any of you die, this is the Quran. Yeah. I said, if any of you die, it says, leaving widows behind, they must wait. This is the instruction. Instruction. The music is the instruction. Yes, so, so, if any of you die, leaving widows behind, they must wait, concerning themselves. Four months and ten days. You say exactly. Word for word. Four months and ten days. I said, do you need an explanation on that? Four months and ten days. But I says, you know, anybody could have guessed four months and ten days. This is attributed to God. That God Almighty inspired Muhammad to say four months and ten days. The widow must wait. With regards to waiting after divorce, it says three months. You know, you wait in case the woman is carrying. Mm. So therefore, three months to know that she's clear, then she can be married. Divorce, after divorce, three months. Is that the order of the Quran? Yeah. After demise of her husband, four months and ten days. Why? That's a question. Very good question. Why four months and ten days? So, in the first instance, I said, look, man, just get it. Any man could have guessed it, any wise man. You know, if he gives a number of people to guess, come on, you, how many? He says, some say three months, you say three months and ten days, you say three and a half months, somebody say four months, somebody say four months and ten days. Uh, somebody could have guessed it. And let's say Muhammad guessed it. Four months and ten days. I'll give you a reason behind it. And what more it says. I said, anybody could have guessed it. And your guess is as good as mine. Okay. But this, there's nothing miraculous about four months and ten days. But I'll show you something miraculous about this book. The next verse says that you may propose marriage to the widow, but do not enter into a marriage contract until the term is fulfilled. I said, that's a miraculous part. You see? It says you can. Four months and ten days, but in the meantime you do not enter into a marriage contract with the widow until the term is fulfilled, four months and ten days. You may propose to her, you may suggest to her, but you can't marry her. Why? Because the woman is emotionally, emotionally not in a condition to make up her mind. Your husband is just gone. Your brother-in-law comes along. I says, sister-in-law, look, don't worry. I'm prepared to give you protection in marriage, you and your children. He said, look, when I've lost my looks, who's going to, in the marriage market, you haven't got any value anymore. Who's going to take me? And here comes along your brother-in-law. He's prepared to marry you. You see? So you say, I'm very happy. I'm delighted. You know, I didn't think anybody would care for me. And I'm not going to pay the rent. He's going to do that. So the guy says, come to call the priest. Come. She's agreeable. Yeah. Under those conditions, we are agreeable. You are a drowning woman clutching at straws. See? So the guy comes along and gets her marriage. That ceremony is over. Now you realize that the guy's a drunkard. He has been beating his wife. He couldn't have kept a job. And you are not tied up with him. Now what are you going to do? How are you going to break it up now? Go to court. Hell. Can you see? So he says, no, no, no. The woman is not in a position to make up her mind. So you can propose, give her some assurances. Don't. But now, month is gone, two months have gone. You tell another like instead of my brother-in-law. Have you forgotten what you used to do this life? You know, this guy can't keep a job. You know, this Thank you very much. He says, now the guy comes along and says, no, thank you, brother-in-law. You know, I'm very little, little, you know, God is great. Something will happen, solve my problem. But you won't get caught. 1,400 years ago, in the desert, this man gives such a law. Four months and ten days. But don't enter into a marriage contract until the law is accomplished. I said, can you imagine a man in the desert giving you such an answer? You don't have to reason. No deduction. In the whole Bible, you can't find an answer like that. So, he said, you see, this is exactly what Jesus said. 
before he started in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Meaning, you haven't the capacity, you have not the capacity, I have the solution to all your problems, to doomsday. And he could appear us. He for this, surplus women, what you do? For drunkenness, what you do? For suicide, what you do? You know, for the racial problem, what you do? He could have given us all, how to solve all the problems. But the people to whom he was addressing, they were not fit to receive it. So he is telling them, his disciples, as we read in the Holy Scriptures, in the New Testament, Jesus is telling his disciples again and again, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, how many times? Dozens of times. Then he explains to them as it is explained to little children. And yet they can't understand. So he said, I even yet without understanding, even yet? Look, how am I explaining to you? They're talking to little children. And you still can't understand what I'm talking about? And when he's provoked further, he says, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I be with you? If he was a Japanese instead of a Jew, he would have committed that honorable haraki suicide. <laughs> Mm-hmm. He couldn't do that. You know, his people. Endless trouble. Everything that he spoke, they misunderstood. Everything. Without exception. Watch. John chapter 13. The ending verses. Jesus tells his disciples, he says, in my father's house there are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Had it not been so, I would have told you. And whither I go, ye know. And the way ye know. You know, that I assume that you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. I'm going to prepare a place for you, spiritually, in heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. So they say, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? All right? Now I'm quoting correctly. That's what they said. In other words, Jesus is talking about spiritual matters. They are thinking of geographical location. Mm-hmm. Like Bloemfontein, Kimberley, Johannesburg. We don't know where you're going and how do you know how to get there? Yeah. This, look, this is the, the whole dialogue taking place there. Mm-hmm. So he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, the way to God are personified in me. Look at me. Truth is personified in me. Look at me. Real life is personified in me. Look at me. The way I am going, you go, you will reach there. So, they still, it's too heavy for them. You know, like the Zulu says, it's too heavy. You know what they're talking about? It's too heavy. You know, it's too heavy to burden stuff. So they said, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices us. You know, all this fancy talk, all this you're talking about. I am the way, the truth and the light and going and preparing place in heaven and mansions in the skies. So look, we don't know what you're talking about. Just show us God and that will be sufficient for us. You know, we'll be satisfied. All this you're talking is too much for us. It's too heavy for us. So just show us God. Philip said that. He wants to see God with his bodily eyes. So Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. Why ask us thou, show us the Father? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. They misunderstood, misunderstood again. Now they say he is the Father. But look, you believe that he is the Son. Jesus is not the Father. He is the Son. Now the Christians say he is the Father. His own Father? How can he be his own Father? No, what he's saying is that if you have seen me, there is no defect in Philip's eyes. A man who can heal the blind, other people's blindness, his own disciple Philip, can't he rectify his defect? Yeah, but no, this is not physical defect. If you have seen me, meaning if you understood me, you would have understood what God is. Like Jesus said, seeing, they see not. Hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. This is not physical seeing and this is not physical hearing. Seeing they see not. What does it mean? You see and you don't see. It means you could have come to the office, you know, looking for the head of the provocation center. And somehow you chatted with this young man, he gave you some literature and you went away. You were looking for me. Next time we meet here, he says, you know, I was looking for Mr. D. Dad. I said, that's me. 
He said, when you were sitting there, I said, yeah. So you were seeing me and you didn't see me. Means you didn't recognize me. Hearing they hear not. Means the man of God is telling you what is right and what is wrong, what you must do, what you must not do. And yet you're not hearkening to that message. But that means you don't hear. You're not hearing. Not that you are deaf. That doesn't mean that they are deaf. See, you're not deaf. But suppose while I'm talking to you, you're hitting everything for a sixer in your mind. Ah, rubbish, rubbish. You know, uh, since my hubby is getting the job, I must give you a nice smiling face and I must keep on nodding my head. That means you're not listening. See? You're just pretending that you are listening. That means you are hearing and you're not hearing. The sound is going to you, but you're not written, you're not listening to anything at all. It's just that you are acting. So, that is what Jesus says. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. So, the, this thing. Philip, he's seeing Jesus. That's Jesus. You know, the Messiah. But he doesn't know the real situation, the position, status of the man. If he understood what a Messiah was, what a messenger of God was, then he would have understood what God was. And you as a Jew, who oh, Philip, says, Philip, you have to know better than that. You know, we are told, it's the belief of the Jews, that no man can see God and live. God is not seen at any time. Any time, whatever you see, is not God. God is not seen at any time. In that case, when you are programmed with that from childhood, that God is not seen at any time, no man can see God and live, how can you make such a silly request that you want to see God with your bodily eyes? So but misunderstanding, continuous misunderstanding. The disciples misunderstood. And his followers today are misunderstanding. He said, look, Jesus went to be God. So where? He said, he and my father are one. It's a continuous misunderstanding. So when we point it out, everything will happen. I'm talking about the learned man. Yeah. So when I show him these things, he's stunned. He's really stunned. So you, know, you can't help agreeing with me. It makes sense. What I'm telling you is making sense. So he said, well, that's your interpretation. I said, right. I said, give me yours. If this is my interpretation, no. you give me yours. Okay. You haven't got it. <laughs> Look. No, no, not necessary. No. Our child is only first year. Yeah. Yeah. That was good. But the DD hasn't got it. Mm-hmm. Believe me, the doctor of divinity is utterly helpless. Because you are programmed from childhood into seeing a certain angle which is not there. For example, I have just stumbled across. You know, I keep on stumbling across because if you are in the field, anything, all these things that she's been telling me about this and that and you know, uh, so many millimeters now. Uh, what for? Because he's in the field. You know, he can say, look, we can take a little extra advantage over this mm. and it won't cost you anything extra, but I'll give you the maximum that I can. Right. If he didn't tell me that, he still would have got the job. But now, how does he know all this? He's in the field. So when you are in the field, you make discoveries. Mm. So, mm. I didn't like this for a Paul for almost all my life. Soon you have a month or two now, I start liking it. Saint Paul. You know, Saint Paul wrote, wrote more than 50% of the books of the New Testament. Out of the 27 books, 14 are written by Paul. More than 50% written by one man. And my experience with Paul was always giving me a bad taste in the mouth. See, when I speak to a Christian, like I'm you know, to as Christian, I said, you see, Jesus said, think not that I am coming to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. So verily I say unto you, heaven and earth pass away, but one jot or one tittle, jot, jot, is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Not even that much, not even that crossing of the T is to pass away from the law, it will all be fulfilled. So whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great. So I am asking the Christian, do you keep the laws and the commandments? He says, no. I said, why not? He says, no, the law is nailed to the cross. So we are living under grace. 
Que lo hace Pipo. No, yo vine antes. Chris. Eso me dice, ¿qué es eso? ¿Qué es Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Colossians, Thessalonians. ¿Qué es eso? ¿Qué es eso? ¿Qué es eso? ¿Qué es No, no. Two yard. Everyone is the two, two yard long words, you know. Huh? Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Colossians, Thessalonians. <laughs> so who's that? This is Paul, 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 Paul. I said, look, who's your master? You said Jesus. I said, what did Jesus say? No, he doesn't want to hear. He doesn't know. He says, Paul. Oh, so naturally, every time I tell you something, I said, do you fast? He says, no. We don't have to fast. When you fast, you do like the Roman Catholic. You know, for 40 days I wanted chocolate. Now they get the 40 days I want to smoke cigarettes. Now they get the 40 days I want to... <laughs> it's me. I said, is that how Jesus fasted? You should follow your master. Didn't Jesus say, he is not of me, who does not take his cross and follow me, take up your cross and follow me. Do what he did. Do as he did. That's what he's telling you. But you don't. You got your own ways, your own inventions. I said, but bulk of Christians them don't. So I said, we are supposed to fast. Jesus tells you. He said, when you fast, do not fast as the hypocrites do. He's telling you how to fast. This is the Jews way fasting. You know, before they go to Jesus, the Jews were fasting. When the fasting season came, they fasted. But when they fasted, they wouldn't wash their faces and they don't brush their hair. They'd muck in the eyes, you know, gloomy, you know, sitting there in some corner. So, Brother Alan comes along, So what's wrong, Uncle? He said, I'm fasting. <laughs> so, you know, here's an impression what a religious man, what a good man he is. You see? For sure. I'm doing it for sure. So, Jesus said, when you fast, my disciple, you. When you fast, you must wash your face and brush your hair of a heavy countenance that nobody knows that you are fasting because you are fasting for the love of God, not for sure. Am I right? So, but you, when you fast, you must do like that. So I said, do you fast? He said, no. So why don't you? You are supposed to fast better than the Jew. The Jew, the Jew are doing it for sure. You mustn't do it for sure, but fast on a higher level. So at every step is telling you what you are supposed to do and how. At every step, he didn't leave you in the vacuum. But nobody's following him. Nobody. The Christian. He is listening to Paul. Paul says this. He is living under grace. He says it's satisfied. He said, look, if he is worthy, if you are. This Billy Graham. Hmm. I have a book by Billy Graham. Uh, how to be uh, how to be born again. How to be born again, you know, Billy Graham. He said if salvation was to be earned by good works. He says, I have no hope of ever reaching there. Billy Graham, he confesses that. In other words, what a water he must be, he knows. You know, there's no hope for him. But he is going to go through faith. He believes. Christ died for his sins. And his salvation is for him. Not good works. Good works he knows. He can't take him there because he hasn't got any. Maybe on the face of it he sounds you know, very pious and all that. But inwardly he knows himself why he's doing everything. So he said, I have no hope. He's hopeless. He says himself. So, <laughs> Paul is coming in my way again and again. Everything I tell you, you quote me, you contradict me with Paul. I quote you Jesus, you quote me Paul. I quote you Jesus, you quote me Paul. Who is a Christian? So naturally, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, when you, every time, I, like, you know, you come along with a quotation, I tell you that, a brilliant science. Brilliant science every time. How do you like brilliant science? will hit them like what? You hear the name brilliant. Now and then something else will brilliant offer this, somebody else offer that, and that, and then among them I can see you are the best. So uh, now you are happy. But every time somebody beats you, it's brilliant science. It's brilliant science is beating you. Huh? So that becomes real anathema. Why is that? That one guy is always coming in the way. So I didn't like the fellow, Paul. But now I have taken a liking for him. Because because I didn't like him, I didn't want to study him. I didn't want to read. I was, I was also prejudiced. I quote you Jesus and you don't want to listen to that, so I brush you off. Now I'm saying, let me see Paul. What does Paul say? And Paul has a chapter on the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is absolutely unique. First Corinthians chapter 15, you remember? It's a chapter on the resurrection. It's known as the chapter of the resurrection. So now I said, let me see, man, what he says, Paul. 
So, verse 3 of chapter 15, verse 3, he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, was buried and rose again, again from the dead according on the third day according to the scriptures. Verse 14. He said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. Correct my child. If Christ is not risen from the dead, and he must die and come back from the dead, if that thing didn't happen, we haven't got a thing for Christians. Our, my, our preaching is vain, useless. The American says, garbage, junk. Our preaching is junk and your faith is junk, garbage. That's the only thing you have. Because no Christian, I mean in all my experience, no Christian ever comes and knocks at my door to tell me I'll teach you hygiene, personal hygiene. We are the most hygienic people. Personal hygiene. No. Generally, out of poverty, people can be an hygienic. I was talking about big, big bugs, you remember, and lice, you remember. Huh? These things are poverty, creates all that sort of thing. You haven't got the means, you haven't got water facility, you know. After the whole year, soap, we used to make our own soap. With fat, I used to buy fat and put caustic soda and me and your auntie used to make soap. Now, they are in those conditions, you know, we had rough time during the war. I see? So, we are the most, we are the most hospitable people. You ask any people, you know. Say, we come into contact with Muslims. This is a fantastic people. We are the most hospitable people. We are the most ethical people. In South Africa, we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. Among all the people, lowest in the country, the Muslim. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest divorce rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. And we have the highest charity rate in the country, compared to what God gave us. So what can you teach me, the Christian? Nothing. The only thing you can tell me is, this is the few people are good people. Only if you had believed in Christ, you would all be like angels walking this earth. But because you don't accept Him as your personal Savior, as your Redeemer, you are all going to hell. Without Christ's redeeming blood, everybody goes to hell, says the Christian. It's not your good works. It's your belief that Christ died for your sins. That is what is going to save you. Because all your good deeds, says the Christian, are like filthy rags. Your good deeds are like filthy rags. Say, you're good people, yes, but you're going to go to hell. They all pity us. You see, good people going to hell. Right? So Paul says, in a nutshell, this is Christianity. The death and resurrection of Jesus. Without that, you haven't got a thing. Then verse 35, he's asking, says, someone may rationally ask, how do the dead rise again? And with what kind of body will they come? This is a natural question. Inquisitive, nothing bad. You want to know, this man, after my grandfather, my great-grandfather, gone to the dust, and I'm sure, you know, there's nothing left at all, even if you dig the, the grave, even the bones won't be there. Mm -hmm. So maybe some trees that sucked up everything and then into the leaves and the thing blew off and got burned and gone into the sea, everything gone into the elements. Right? So now, how will God, what, what kind of resurrection would that be? You know? And with what kind of body are we going to come back? It's a rational question. Mm -hmm. okay. So he poses the question and he answers it himself. Verse 42. He says, It is sown a perishable body, means buried. Mm -hmm. Whatever you bury is perishable. And it is raised an imperishable body. Or in some Bibles it says, it is sown a corruptible body and it is raised an incorruptible. It means the same thing. Perishable or incorruptible, incorruptible. It means the same thing. So what is sown is perishable, this, and it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown, means buried, in dishonor and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body and it is raised a spiritual body. Very easy. You don't need a dictionary for that. You don't need a DD to explain. Am I right, my child? It is sown a physical body. You understand? Physical body. Physical. 
It is really the spiritual body, intangible. This is the tangible body, there will be intangible. This is physical, there will be spiritual. It's not like this. So look, this is what Paul says. Do you agree with that? Everybody does. I also agree. Because I, I look, God can do it if He wants to bring us all physically from Adam to eternity. He can. From the elements, He can bring you together again. If He wants to. He can. I believe He can. But I said, look, this is not the way. This is not what the scripture, this is not what Jesus said. This is not what uh, Paul said. This is not what Muhammad said. Because physically, if you all get up from Adam to eternity, to doomsday, there won't be standing room on this earth. <laughs> and then this body needs food and liquid. And you will, you will be simmering in your own poor Turkish bath, you know. And then up to your neck, you will be in it. Am I? You will drink. You will There's no place to sit down. To excrete even. You will just stack it. So like sheep and goats. You will know, so be in our own mess. Mm. That's enough. A billion souls can be accommodated in this little room. A billion. And we won't be colliding with one another. The mind of man doesn't occupy space. Your mind, my mind, me and mine. Souls. They don't occupy any space. They are beyond time and space. So, this is be a spiritual resurrection. You will be real, but not physical. See, spiritual, not tangible. Something you can feel and no. This is what we believe about the resurrection. So, I said, that's what Paul says. And now, see, I agree with him 100%. Now, the reason why he's thinking like that is because his experience was spiritual. His own experience. You remember he was on the way to Damascus. And on the Damascus road he saw a vision of Jesus Christ. There was a great light and he heard the voice speaking to him in the Hebrew tongue. Saying, Saul, Saul, what persecutest thou me? Why kickest thyself against the prince? What do you persecute? So are you Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. So he saw a vision of Jesus. He didn't meet him physically, like I'm meeting Mr. Hutton. You know, tangible as I'm touching him. No, it wasn't like that. It was a spiritual experience. The people that were with him, he says, they saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice. You can see, it only appeared to him. Like some of us, you know, we might be worked up. And you see ghosts in the room, yeah. You can talk to them. So your granny, you're talking to her. And we are all Jesus. Where? He's in the He's talking to her. So it appears to you but doesn't appear to us. That means it's not tangible. It's not physical. If it's physical, then there's something wrong with me if you see and I don't see. But things that are intangible, it can appear. Your mind maybe is overwrought, you know, worked up. Or maybe it's rich. you're so fine, you're so subtle that you can see subtle things which I can't. We are too crude for that. You see? So now, he sees Jesus. No, he doesn't see Jesus. He says Jesus appeared to him. It appeared to him. He appeared. He didn't meet him. He appeared to him. Right. So because of his personal experience, he's thinking everybody had the same experience. So he said, and he appeared to Peter, and he appeared to the twelve, and he appeared to the five hundred, and he last of all appeared to me. See, he keeps on repeating the word, appeared, appeared. Because, because it appeared to anything, everybody has that apparition if they saw. They didn't meet Jesus in the physical meeting. Right. Because his knowledge was like that. He hadn't met Jesus in his life. Paul, never. He didn't see Jesus. He didn't know what Jesus looked like. In his 14 books, he never mentions the mother of Jesus. That's how he was born. He's just... He's only philosophizing, you know, theorizing. He doesn't give any details about the crucifixion. Not one word. What happened and how. Nothing. He's only developing a theology upon the death and resurrection of Jesus. That he heard the man died and he woke up again. He said, what? In what form? He said, spiritual. Because he saw spiritual. Mm. We find Jesus also telling us the same thing. In Luke chapter 20, verse 36. You see, the Jews came to him with a poser, with a riddle. They are always coming to him with poses and riddles. They are not trying to make a fool of him. Mm. Master, must we pay tribute to Caesar or not? Master, this woman we caught her in the act, what must we do to her? Master, we would have a sign of thee. Shh. Again and again. They are coming to him, you know, somehow to embroil him somewhere, you know, trip him somewhere along the line. Now they come to him 
They said, Master, Rabbi, they said, there was a woman in my ass, a Jewess, and she had seven husbands, according to a Jewish practice. If one husband dies, leaving no offspring, then the second brother takes a wife. And when he fails the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh, seven guys had this one woman, one after another. But there was no problem, because it was all one by one. And in time, the woman died. And the men died. There was no problem. They want to know from Jesus that at the resurrection, which guy is going to have her? Because they all had her care. They experienced her, you know, as a wife. So naturally, everybody with a personal feeling toward the woman. So in heaven, everybody waking up simultaneously. Seven guys. They see this woman, everybody say, my pro, my wife, umgami, you know, my sweetheart, my dad. Everybody is thinking he is the only one who knows her. As a wife. So, because seven guys going for this one woman, there will be a war in heaven between the brothers for this one woman. Because as far as everyone is concerned, he's the only one who's supposed to know her as a wife. So, which guy is going to have her on the other side? That's the question. Pose it. They're putting to Jesus. In answer to that, Jesus says, Neither shall they die any more. Meaning that once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. This is a mortal body which has got its mortal needs, food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. Without these, no Englishman, no Indian, no African, nobody. We need all these things to survive, to multiply. That body is an immortal body. No food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest. Not of the type that we know. Neither shall they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, meaning that they will be angelized, they will be spiritualized, they will be spiritual creatures, they will be spirits. The resurrected bodies will be spirits, for they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. Such are the children of the resurrection. Such spirits. Agree? That's what Jesus said. The resurrected bodies will be spirits. Paul says they'll be spirits. You say they'll be spirits. I say they'll be spirits. Right. Resurrection, spiritual. Now let us see what actually happened. Jesus returns to that upper room where they had the last supper. After his alleged crucifixion, he goes in and he wishes his disciples in the Hebrew language, Shalom Aleichum, which means peace be unto you, free the fire. That's a Jewish way, Muslim way. He says, Salam Alaikum, please be to you. Same as Hebrew. This is Shalom, this is Salam. Same. Same word. Meaning the same thing. He says, Peace be unto you. And when he said, Peace be unto you, his disciples were terrified. I'm asking, why were they terrified? Because when you meet your long lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, what do you do? You're happy, elated. And we Eastern people, we embrace one another and we kiss one another. The Jew, the Arab. That's what we do. <laughs> no. But instead of doing that to Jesus, they are terrified. So why were they terrified? So Luke tells us that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit. They thought that he was a spirit. So I'm asking, why did they think the man is? Did he look like a spirit? And hundred percent. In my forty years, no Christian born has ever told me that he looked like a spirit. Unless you are the first one to say you look like a spirit. Because if you do, then I say, what does a spirit look like? Mm. You know, tell me now, what does it look like, a spirit? No, he didn't look like a spirit. So I said, why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like a spirit? So you're puzzled. So I said, you, look, the reason is that the disciples of Jesus, they had heard from hearsay what people were talking, that the Master was hanged on the cross. They had heard from hearsay that he had killed up the coast, in other words, he had died. Mm. They had heard from hearsay what people were talking, that now he's dead and buried for three days. Because they were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses to that. All the, all the knowledge was from hearsay. Because Mark chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. All. I'm 
asking, madam, does all mean all in your language? Or does it mean all? I'm asking the Afrikaner. He says to, to make almal from farla and khafla. I said, does almal mean almal in your language, you Afrikaner? He said, yes. So, but she is born, ke baba lega. I said, does bonke mean bonke in your language, you Zulu? He said, yes. That means they're not there. All means all. Bonke means bonke. Almal means almal. They were not there. So all the knowledge is from hearsay. When hearsay knowledge, if you know about a man who is dead in bed for three days, you expect him to be stinking in his grave. Such a person, when you see, naturally you are terrified. That he is a ghost, is a spook. So Jesus wants to assure them that it is not what they are thinking. So he says, he says, Behold my hands and my feet. Have a look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And the same fellow man, them fools, what are you afraid of me for? He said, handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. A spirit means any spirit. So if I have flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I said, is that what it means in your language? If I have flesh and bones, in that case, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I'm asking, is that what it means in your language? Yeah. Of course. Possible. You won't have any meaning. That's what it means. Mm-hmm. I say, in other words, he's telling you that the body that you're seeing, it is not a translated body, it is not a metamorphosed body, it is not a resurrected body. Because the resurrected bodies get spiritualized. Mm-hmm. You say, who said so? I said, you said so. And Paul said so. And Jesus said so. And Muhammad said so. And I say so. The whole world says so. Mm-hmm. So he's telling you it's not resurrected. And on the death and resurrection of Jesus, the whole of Christianity is based. Without that, Paul says, your faith is worthless, rubbish, vain, and your preaching is vain. So the whole of Christianity is based upon a false premise. If that false premise is false, all your good deeds floating in the air, flying in the air, you know, performing miracles by the millions, worthless, rubbish, not worth anything. So says Paul, what has the Christian God? I said, come, talk to me. Listen it in your language. This is your language. You read your language in the Bible in your own language and tell me whether I am not understanding your language. That is what the Christian has to do to tell me. Say, look, you don't understand English. You must tell me. The American must tell me you don't understand English. So come on, teach me. I want to learn. I know in your language at times you speak in opposites and you mean something else, you see. Like, this is. Uh, you know, you're driving too fast. So, Mrs. says, slow down. I like, slow down. Mm-hmm. So, and you still carry on. So your daughter but says, Dad, why, why, why don't you slow up? <laughs> Mother, mommy is telling you. She was saying slow down. And she says, why don't you slow up? Yeah. Up and down mean the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Whether you say slow down or slow up, you mean the same thing. Right? Mm-hmm. So up and down in English, it can mean the same thing. In and out, I can show you. Also, in English, you can mean the same thing. When you say in, you mean out. When you mean out, you mean in. I can show you that to demonstrate to you. In English, it, it can. You can speak like that. But tell me now, when the man says the spirit has no flesh and bones, it means the spirit has flesh and bones. Tell me. How to listen to you in your language. When the man says the spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see me have. So I'm not a spirit. I'm not resurrected. Because a resurrected person gets spiritualized. Paul says so. It is so on a physical body, that's what he imagined Jesus to be. And it was raised a spiritual body. He says, I'm not spirit, I'm spiritual. And he's eating boiled fish and honeycomb. And he's ever in disguise. Sunday morning, first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb and she finds the tomb empty. I'm asking, why did she go there? So the scripture says she went to anoint him. I'm only reading your scripture. It says she went to anoint him. I said, now the Hebrew word for anoint is masaha, from which we get the word Messiah in Hebrew and Masid in Arabic, which means to wrap, to massage, to anoint. So tell me now whether Jews massage dead bodies after three days. The Jew says, no. I said, you Christian, do you massage dead bodies after three days? He says, no. I said, we are the closest to the Jew. Do we massage dead bodies after three days? The answer is no. Then why would the disciple Mary want to go and massage the rotting body of Jesus? Because within three hours, rigor mortis sets in. You know, the hardening of the cell. Mm. The body starts fermenting from within. Such a rotting body, when you massage it, falls to pieces. 
Does it make sense that after three years you want to go and massage it? I know it is. Do what? And it's already surrounded with hundred pounds worth of medicals and a shroud. And what she's going to do here? We massage what? Unless she can, she's looking for a life person. She, she must have seen signs of life in that limp of body when it was taken down from the cross. She was about the only woman besides Joseph of Arimathy and Nicodemus who had given the final rise to the body of Jesus. All the other disciples had forsaken him and fled. So if she had seen signs of life, she was not going to shout and say, He's alive! He's alive! The Jews would have made them be sure that they killed him. So, three days later she comes along, she wants to give him treatment. So she goes to the tomb and she finds that the stone is removed and the winding sheet's inside. So she starts to cry. It's an empty climax to what she had expected. So I'm asking, why was the stone removed and why were the winding sheets unbound? Because for a resurrected body, you don't have to remove the stone to come out. For a resurrected body, you don't have to unwind the winding sheets to move. That's the need of this physical body. Removing the stone, unwinding the winding sheets. This body needs that. So it's an anti-climax to what she had expected. So she cries. So Jesus was watching her from wherever he was. Not from heaven, but from this earth. This tomb was a privately owned property belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich influential disciple of his, who could afford to carve out of a rock a big gloomy chamber, which according to Jim Bishop, a Christian authority, he says it was five feet wide by seven feet high by fifteen feet deep with a ledge of ledges inside. Around this tomb was his vegetable garden. Joseph of Arimathea, his vegetable garden. I said, don't tell me that this Jew was so generous that he was planting vegetables, vegetables five miles out of town for other people's sheep and goats to graze upon. Surely he must have got his gardener's quarter, people towards the garden, to look at, and perhaps his country home where he went for the weekend with his family. So Jesus is there, he sees this woman, he knows who she is, and he knows why she is there. So he walks up to her and he finds her crying. So he says, woman, why weepers thou? Whom seekest thou? I said, doesn't he know? Why does he ask such a silly question? It's not a simple question. You see, actually he's pulling her leg. You know, metaphorically, playing the fool. He's been through an ordeal, but he's still got the sense of humor. He knows she's looking for him and she can't recognize him because of the disguise. She says, Woman, why are you first thou? Whom seekers thou? He's playing the fool with her. She supposing him to be the gardener. I said, Why does she suppose he's a gardener? Do resurrected bodies look like gardeners? You know, after I heard the response. Your husband in the hereafter looks like a gardener, and your father in law looks like a gardener, and your 12 year old son will look like a gardener. Does it make sense? Everybody looks like a gardener. You won't know which your husband and which your father in law and which is your son in law. No. That says the rest of everybody will be yours, you yourself. Everybody will be able to recognize you. It's a real you, not this camouflage. At the moment, these are camouflages we are. So she's supposing him to be the gardener. Says, Sir, if you have taken him hands, Tell me, where have you laid him? To rest, to relax, to recuperate, not where have you buried him? So that I might take him away. I, alone, one woman, a frail Jewess, she's going to carry Jesus and take him away. A dead body. At least 160 pounds. A young carpenter. And another 100 pounds made of American made in 260. And this frail Jewess is going to carry him like an American superwoman and take him away. Bury him as a wood at the grave. You say, my race, who does the grave? And look, carrying is one thing, and going and putting in a grave is the dumping it in a hole. Does it make sense? Maybe she can carry it, a superwoman. But she, to bury 260 pounds now, dump it in a hole. You expect her to do that? So she's supposing to be the guy. Says, Sir, if you have taken him in, tell me, where have you laid him? So that I might take him away. I alone, one woman. Take him, not yet. The joke is gone too far. So he says, Mary, you know, the way he says, Mary, the way he articulates it, she's used to hearing, like, still I haven't got it. You know, I know I can spell it for you now. Mm-hmm. But I can't. It's still, I'm, 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 I'm not going to try. How to pronounce it? How, how to his name? Lisa. Yeah, he said. You know what? It's hard because we're never, not used to that, that formation or that yeah. sound. Yeah. You see? So uh, spelling now, I can do it now. But it's not Because if it was another name like Mary or Elizabeth and all that, it was straight away because I'm used to the, those names. Yes. I can retain it. But not Lisa, you know. I might say something else again. You see, right? So the way Jesus says Mary, she recognizes the man that this is Jesus. So she wants to grab him. I said, for what? 
spite him. No. To pay respects. We Eastern people, we do. But that will be murder for him. He will be in the Lord. I said, oh my. He's going to kill him. She says, touch me not. I said, why not? Is he a bundle of electricity, a dynamo, that if she touches him, she'll get electrocuted? No. I said, so why not? I said, because it hurts. You give me another reason. Why not? He said, because I'm not yet ascended to my father. I said, is she blind? Can't she see the man standing there beside her? What does it mean I'm not gone up when I'm here? No. In the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, he is saying, I am not dead yet. That's why didn't she recognize him? Who? Mary, why didn't she recognize him? He's disguised. He's disguised because he's terrified of the Jews. Because if the Jews saw it, they make a doubly sure that they kill him. He had escaped death by the skin of his teeth. Well, no. Now can you see that? The whole, whole picture, can you see? Yeah. The man, suppose he escaped death. He didn't die. And he told you he was not to die. How can he escape this, sir? Right, he is telling you. How? Did he, it's a he didn't die on the cross. He didn't die on the cross. No, he's telling you. So, he's, then, he's, how can Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everything is talk about him dying? Right, right. let's hear, let's hear Matthew. Let's see, let's hear Matthew. You see, we are assuming, we are reading into scripture. We all have a tendency to read into whatever we are programmed with. Yeah, the Jehovah's Witness, this is Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah everywhere. Am I right? The Seventh-day Adventist, see the Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath everywhere. Am I right? The Baptist is Baptist and Baptist and Baptist and everywhere. Am I right? Program. You program with this, you see that. Zion, Zion, you know the Zion church. They just say that one word Zion made a religion out of it. So how is it that they see that you don't see Zion? How is it that the other guy says Jehovah and you didn't see Jehovah? How is it that the other guy says Sabbath and you didn't see Sabbath? No. This is how we are all getting programmed. Let's see actually what the scripture says. See? Our basis must be scripture, not what the church says. My church, your church. Hmm? Because every church has got its own uh, prejudices. They want to propagate certain ideas. So the Seventh-day Adventists, you know, they specialize on the Sabbath. And they'll beat you on the Sabbath. The Jehovah's Witness, they specialize on the word Jehovah. They'll beat you on the word Jehovah. <laughs> so everybody is a specialist. Right? We don't want to be specialists. We want to know the truth of God. So let us read it as it says, as it is. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. You read there that the, the, the Jews come again to Jesus. Again, they come to him. You know, I told you, that doesn't matter. They said, Master, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, we would have a sign of thee. In other words, we want you to show us a miracle, to convince us that you are about the normal, about the ordinary. You are the Messiah we are waiting for. Somebody supernatural. You see? Master, we would have a sign of thee. Sign doesn't mean a road sign. Stop, you'll go. They won't move. Am I right? Am I right? So Jesus answers them and says unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. They're horrible people, rubbish. You're looking for sign, miracles. Aren't you listening to me? What are you? Can't you hear what I'm telling you? I'm guiding you to God. I'm, you know, healing the blind, the lepers, and quickening the dead. Are these not signs enough? They say, no, no. You know, something super. You see? Like walking on the water, flying in the air like a bird. Do something, man, that we can't do. So Jesus reacts. You know, it's a message you should be interested in, not tricks. So he said, an evil and adulterous generation seek it after a sign, but they shall no sign be given unto it, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Am I quoting correctly? If you doubt, the Bible is here. I can bring it for you. You see? It says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the way, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the way, so shall the Son of Man, that's himself, be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. The word in is the operative word. As Jonah was in the belly of the way, so shall I be in the belly of the earth. I am asking, how was Jonah in the belly of the way? How was he? So, go to the book of Jonah. It's only one page. It don't take you five minutes. But you don't have to go there. Every Sunday school child knows the story. Every Muslim child knows the story. Every Jewish child knows. Everybody knows the story of Jonah and the way. Amazing. Mm. Whether you are a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu, anybody, everybody knows Jonah and the way. So, I said, what happened? 
says, I'll just refresh your memory, that Jonah was commanded by God to go to Nineveh to warn the people of Nineveh that they must repent in sackcloth and in ashes, meaning they must humble themselves before the Lord, or God was going to destroy them. Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, the city of 100,000 people, he goes to Joppa, modern Jaffa, See? and he's running away, he takes a boat and is running away, he's going to Parashe, because he's despondent. He said, these material people, people of Nineveh, they will listen to me, they'll make a mockery of me, <laughs> talking about God and punishing, I said, man, what are you talking about, old fairy tales? What's my face before that? Suppose God doesn't do it. <laughs> Yeah, they'll make a fool of me. Mm -hmm. So, instead of doing his duty, he runs away. At sea, there's a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, anybody who runs away from his master's command creates such a turmoil at sea. So, they begin to question who can be responsible for this turmoil. So, Jonah realizes that he is a guilty man. Because as a prophet of God, he is a soldier of God. And as a soldier of God, he had no right to do things presumptuous on his own. The soldier does, but then the commander tells him, go to Nineveh, he goes to Nineveh, prophet law, go to Nineveh, he goes to Nineveh. But this man is running away. He said, look, God is after my blood, and he wants to kill me, and in the process he'll sink the boat, and you innocent people will die. So he makes a manly comeback. He doesn't want innocent people to suffer on his behalf. So he said, look, it will be all right. You, God is after my blood. You throw me overboard. Get rid of me, and you will be saved. What a manly comeback is made. He's no coward. Yes, he did something foolish. He is prepared to pay the full price for his mistake. So they said to him, man, you know you might be wanting to commit suicide. Yeah. You know, so you want us to help you? Mm. No, no, no. We have our own system of knowing right from wrong. And that is what is called casting of lots. Like hello tail. Yes. Throwing of the dice. So they started casting lots. And according to the casting of the lots, it came to the turn of Jonah that Jonah was the guilty man. So they took him and they threw him overboard. I'm asking, my child, that when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? But before you answer, I don't want you to make a mistake. Look, Jonah had volunteered, like you. Suppose now you when you came and said, look, uncle, if you have something else to do, you are very busy, we don't mind coming again another time. We don't want to hold you up, you know, from your work. So I said, no, 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 what you want to sit down, Then I get an urgent call. I said, excuse me, please forgive me. You know, I have no solution, I'm sorry. I'm going to go. But when I get the phone call, I don't have to catch you by the scruff of the neck and start booting you out. You know, that you damn Westerners, you got no respect for other people's time and money and whatnot. Yeah. What are you taking for? I'm a lunatic. See? So, <laughs> Jonah, because he volunteered, see, Jonah volunteered. So when you throw him, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. Am I right, man? Mm -hmm. A man who volunteers, like you, if you volunteer, I don't, I don't have to handle you. I said, excuse me, Mrs. Adams, please, you know, forgive me. Huh? All right, I'm going. I can leave the house and go because I'm urgent call. I don't have to handle you, touch you. So Jonah, they don't have to strangle him before throwing because he volunteered. You don't have to spear him before throwing. You don't have to break his arm or limb in a karate grip before throwing. Am I right? So when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? Alive. You have no price for that. That was a very simple question. <laughs> you don't deserve anything. That's correct. The Jews said he was alive. The Christians said he was alive. And the Muslims said he was alive. They are all united on this one point. That Jonah was alive. So when they threw him overboard. I say a fish came and cobbled him. Dead or alive? Dead or alive in the public. He was dead. Dead. Does the book say that? It says that he went down to Sheol, which is hell. When they threw him he into was the alive water. alive in the water. Right. But he couldn't have been alive in the belly of the whale. No. But the Bible tells you, Jonah, book of Jonah, that he prayed to God from the fish's belly. Do dead people pray? He said he prayed from Sheol, which is hell. And he can't go physically to hell. Right. So now, how does he go? Right. So now, when he came out, where the soul came there again? Mm. It's just that he died. From Sheol. 
Then the book of Jonah says that. It says that he, he went down to Sheol no, and, he, no. and he cried to God from there. And then he his now, came back. Which, which Bible is that that says he went to hell? I think sure. it's in the Bible. No, which one? Have you got one in the car? No, no I've got one. Just get one from next to the bed. Yeah. Just stop. <laughs> when you get it, I'll let our child see this. Why are you putting us on tape? <laughs> no, no, no. You can give you a copy. We want to give you a copy so that you yeah. can see it at home. And listen again. Analyze it. See, when you analyze it like this, not at the moment, maybe on the spur of the moment, you know, you have so many beautiful thoughts and so many ideas that are not there. Yeah. Good mm-hmm. night. They're called you, brother. Mm-hmm. Brother, just not be like them. I was just going to ask you a question yes. while this is looking at it. What is this? What do you think you would have been here? Mm. Well, you know, I've got a photograph of my mom next to my bed. Now, my mom and I were very, very, very close. And I always take uh, a bit of peace from thinking that, well, one day perhaps I'll, you know, I'll, I'll meet up with her again. Yes. And I just wonder well, if we, all, we all have that feeling. Mm. My mother died, my sister died, my daughter died. So, you know, if you have that feeling of yearning, now, it depends on us and them also. You see, that whether you belong to the same category, mm. soul is category. If you belong to that rotten place and your mother belongs to a nice kind of place. Mm-hmm. So there is no way of coinciding. And there, according to what they're told, that in heaven you will be made to forget all kinds of um, unpleasant things. That in life, you know, you beat me down on this. Mm-hmm. You know, you did that to me. And if all that is forgotten. Mm-hmm. Because now that, if you remember, this is going to make hell for you there, mm-hmm. in heaven. You know, because when I see you, <laughs> the devil is here. Yeah, yeah. See, that my life is becoming uncomfortable, unbearable to see him there. So, it's all blotted out. It's, you know, the whole thing becomes positive. You know, uh, all the good qualities about you, I see you, see all the good qualities, and the, the bad things about you are blotted out. Because what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, he said, and I will not remember my sin. Once he, he's not like you and me. I said, look, I forgive you. Uh, Ellen, you know, you did me down there, I forgive you. Then something else happened again. I said, you know, Ellen, you did me down there. Yeah. I keep on reminding you all your life. But I told you, I forgive you. Mm-hmm. In other words, I haven't, I haven't really forgiven. When God says, I forgive you, He says, I will not remember that sin. Finish. It's blotted out, it's blotted out. Mm-hmm. You won't remind yourself, you know, look, I let you go there. No. Did you find it, my uh, child? Jonah, what does it say? It says, uh, um, from deep, um, from deep inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Right. In my distress, O Lord, I called to you and you answered me. Right. From deep in the world of the dead, right. which, in, which in my Bible and in other versions as well, it's got study notes on the bottom. Right. And the world of the dead is Sheol. Right. That's hell. Right. And it says, and you heard me. You threw me down into the depths to the very bottom of the sea, where the waters were all around me and your mighty waves rolled over me. I thought I'd been banished from your presence and never see your temple again. Right. The water came over me and choked me. The sea he covered me completely and seaweed was wrapped around my head. I went down to the very roots of the mountains into the land whose gates were lo- are locked forever. These are, you see, it's a metaphorical things. You know, he says, you know, says, oh, I was dead. You know what happened to me? All my legs were broken. But how do you know? How do you know it's metaphorical and not real? You see, when you read a language that like Jesus is talking about, for example, he says, let the dead bury the dead. You remember? They say, let the dead bury the dead. Have you read that before? Let the dead bury the dead. Now, if it means what it says, your father dies. I want you to come and say, my son says, come, let's go to the dance. He says, if my dad has died, then you know, at least <laughs> in the very before we go along, and on in all the holy way. So he says, let the dead bury the dead. Yes, right. Jesus said that, let the dead bury the dead. So, so now it means what it says. That means the dead people must come from the grave and take your father, your grandfather, and bury him. That's what it means. Let the dead bury the dead. How can dead people bury dead people? Except they come out of the grave and carry your father away. Does it happen like that? Yeah, no, what does he no. mean then? No. So now, therefore, in that case, we have to start finding out what it means. You see, but suppose we are ready, I'll give you that. I'll give you that just now. Uh, 
But we read in uh, Luke, I think, chapter 3, verse 23 or 21, it says, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. Do you need an interpretation? Eight days means eight days. Yes. Circumcised means circumcised. No. You need no interpretation. So the Christian scholars, they tell us, and I agree with them, they said, if the plain reading of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Then the plain reading mm -hmm. makes common sense. You mustn't seek any other sense. Mm -hmm. Unless you are pervert. Your sickness is in you. Plain reading. Mm -hmm. But now comes the difficult question. When Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's difficult. Mm -hmm. That's not plain reading now. So I said, now how can he be his own father? So it says, no, 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 no. What he means is that if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. It is it? Now you can explain. Yes. Unless you have a better explanation than that. Hmm? But he says, I am the Father. Right. He doesn't say he's the Father. Uh -huh. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Then I come to the house. I want to get something from the house. He says, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Peter. I have no instruction to part with it. I says, where is Alan? He said, look, if you have seen me, you have seen this Alan. Mm -hmm. If I have seen you, I've seen him. In other words, look, Alan won't tell you anything other than what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. You can't have this from the house. Right? It doesn't mean that you are Mr. Alan. Yes, so you can speak like that. Why did, why did Jesus say, I'm the father of one? Yes. I and my father. That and is a conjunction between the two different persons. I and my father are one. They say, me and my husband are one. On what? Adam and Eve were one. You read that? They were one flesh. Sausage? One flesh is a sausage. Were they a one sausage? Husband and wife? No. What it means is you are one. Means Adam says, let's go and break the apples. All right. The other, Eve says, let's go fishing. All right. You are one. Whatever in, in tune, whatever he says, what he says, you say, let, let's leave the country. You say, right? Have it? We agree. There's no, no, no conflict. You say, we are one. And yet, you are Mrs. Hutton and he is Mr. Hutton. You can't sign, sign his checkbook. This check, you can't unless he's given you the power. You see? So if you sign, you can be charged with forgery. So the thing is that when you speak like this, I and my father are one. So it makes two. I and. So this one is now what? 